So I came to the country, um, I came to Alaska in the Air Force in 1976. And in 1977, a friend approached me at work and said, hey, do you want to go dip netting? I'm like, well, what's dip netting? He goes, oh, you, you go to this river with this net on a long handled pole and you stick it in the water and you pull fish out. I'm like, well, where do you do that? He goes, Chitna. I'm like, well, where the hell is Chitna? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll try it. You know, so three of us with one net drove from Anchorage to Chitna and hiked down the Copper River from O'Brien Creek, three and a half miles into the canyon, found a spot to dip, and we took turns with the net. And when it was their turn, they kept pulling out reds and I kept getting nothing, <laughs> you know, and I was like sorely disappointed. But towards the end of the day, it was my turn with the net and I stuck the net in and I pulled out a 35 pound king salmon, white meat king salmon, like this. And it just made my day. It was a beautiful sunny day in July and I caught a fish that would feed everybody in my Air Force squadron. And I was a cook in the Air Force, so having a fish to take home that would feed everybody that lived in my building at once was just this grand treat. And I sat there looking across the river out the Chitna Valley going, wow, a person could catch fish and live off of it and live over there. That's what I want to do. And it took me 10 years from catching that king salmon south of O'Brien Creek in Woods Canyon to putting a roof on this building and moving here permanently. Fish brought me to Cordova. Um, I'm a fish biologist by, uh, you know, through education, and um, I was working back in New York State with uh, the transplanted salmon that they have there, basically Pacific salmon that they brought over and popped into Lake Ontario, and uh, that kind of got me uh, involved with doing research on salmon. And uh, the next logical step for me to take was get over to the West Coast where we have wild salmon and there's no better place for that than Alaska. And I was lucky enough to uh, get a job here in Cordova and uh, came up here for about three months and uh, I, it just stuck with me. I've been here ever since. Kenny Lake was established as a farming community um, about in the 1950s. There had been a roadhouse and kind of a trail going through, but that's when Kenny Lake became established. And this is really where I fell in love with the Copper River Valley. When I was a kid, I remember driving to Chitna and you'd come down the hill. It's on the other road. You'd come down the hill and boom, all of a sudden there were mountains and there were farms and you'd go, oh, wow, this is an amazing place. We knew when we got married that we wanted to raise our family here in Gakona because it was such an awesome place for him to grow up and we just knew that was the lifestyle we wanted for our kids. My name is Eric Lutz, uh, the owner of the uh, Glen Allen Rustic B&B Resort in Glen Allen, Alaska, in the, in the heart of the Copper Basin. I used to work for the National Park Service. Uh, um, I've also uh, been in the watershed area, the Copper Basin area, for about 22 years now. I uh, started, uh, came up here working for Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Um, the largest park in the National Park Service system. Um, I enjoy this area. I came up here, why did I stick here? It's really confusing to me sometimes. I wonder that actually, how it all came about or why it came about. But uh, I think one of my favorite things about this place is uh, the lack of traffic lights. And that sounds kind of, uh, you know, very put a pinpoint on something but i realized that i don't spend my time uh, in traffic 
The thing that I love about up here is the wildlife, the beautiful, beautiful scenery. I'm, and I never ever get tired of the wildlife. I, I'll stop, I still stop and look at moose and, and anything that I see alongside the road because it is just amazingly beautiful. I mean, we, our clients with hunting, they spend a lot of time traveling the world, so they see a lot of beautiful places for sure. But one thing that came up a lot this year, especially because up there, so I go up and I cook, my sister-in-law and I cook, and we're the camp cooks, and we both have all our kids there, and they see the life our kids get to experience, and it's pretty unique. And that was more so was the comment of, wow, your kids, this is amazing that they get to grow up like this. And, and I think that's becoming more and more rare, you know, unless you're intentional about it. One thing I think when people uh, come out here, one thing they really notice is how wild it is, right? This is about as wild as you can get, I think in America without leaving the road system. Um, you know, you can drive here to McCarthy, which is different than a lot of Alaska, right? Um, but accessing here is, is fairly remote. Um, and just the pristine nature of, of where we're living um, and, uh, and the wildness of it. Really, really, I think it's hard to define, but that's kind of a word that fits it, is just how wild it is still. I mean, to me, when I think about my favorite place in the world, it's gonna be the journey between 36 Mile and Copper, on the Copper River Highway, which is as far as we can go now um, from Cordova, the journey from there up to up to our camps, and uh, you know that it's it's basically uh, you know me solo in a boat boating up the river for a few hours, and uh, you know the lower river it's all very braided. Um, you're basically following channels and on the outside edges of those channels there's just miles of log jams and uh, you know that river changes pretty regularly so you're always reading the river but um, as you progress further up river you get closer to Miles Lake and you're literally boating on a river right along Child's Glacier so you just have this epic glacier on one side of you and, uh, and a nice river bank on the other side and you're just boating up hoping the thing doesn't calve as as you're boating past but it's it's pretty amazing you know to see to see an area where you have a river that that varies from you know 40,000 CFS to 400,000 CFS within a single season that's cubic feet per second to to, to have a river that that's that dynamic just crashing into a glacier and doing a dog leg and coming around and causing that glacier to calve i mean that's that's a really cool cool thing to be a part of and see um, and then as you progress past that the river just opens up to this this epic lake and um, Miles Lake and it's like a lake in the middle of the river right so very very still water you know super wide you, you know eight miles wide and uh, on the other end is is Miles Glacier so you know you have the river that just moves between these two gigantic glaciers and uh, you know, you're boating around icebergs that are the size of houses, and, and you're, this is just like a daily commute. It's an intact watershed, and that's unique. You know, a lot of places when we talk about watersheds, we'll talk about, say, the Columbia River watershed, and they've got giant dams, and they've got, it's running through cities, it's been channelized, there's industrial pollution, both new and old. You have all these problems, and here we have this watershed that really is, it functions as a whole. There's no major gaps in our ecosystems. Uh, we have a chance to keep a watershed intact. I think a lot of what we've seen around the world um, as early civilizations developed, rivers were the place for commerce and transportation, and so they became heavily impacted as communities grew up around them and the industrial practices um, increased. 
And here uh, we have one of the largest impact wetlands in North America at the mouth. There's no channelization as this river meets the ocean. Uh, we have no major mining or development threats up in our headwaters. There's no dams, there's no irrigation. Um, so, and we still have communities that can subsist on the resources that they can hunt and harvest here. We have wild natural salmon populations here that have been untouched, you know, for the last 7,000 years, just naturally evolving in this habitat. Um, you know, we don't depend on uh, giant hatcheries to mitigate and offset, um, you know, habitat destruction or, or you know, uh, mortality associated with dams and whatnot. We don't have that here. We have a perfect ecosystem in a, in a watershed that's just fairly pristine and I think that's something that needs to be valued and recognized. And I think everyone here in the watershed does realize that and I think most people do cherish that but um, we need the world to recognize how important that is. When we do youth programs and that's one of the biggest things we do together, one of the things we teach the youth is the saying we all live downstream. And, and we really challenge the youth to really embrace that idea and understand it. And so what we all leave, live downstream means, you know, like literally it means that if I pollute the watershed here and you live downstream, that you're gonna see the impacts. But especially because we've got the salmon coming up and down the river, we do all leave, live downstream. And so something that happens down in the Copper River Delta it could affect us really profoundly up here. We're connected with that river. And um, it's hard sometimes to realize how connected we are because of the disconnect in traveling, because of the really, really different cultures. We have two different nat native cultures. Um, because of the different ecosystems, there are temperate rainforests down there. We're a boreal forest, you know, we get 50 below. There, it's a super cold day if they get you know, 20 above, 10 above. And so we're super, super different. And I think that means you need to work harder to find the commonalities. And the commonality, the big one is salmon. Bar none, you know, everyone here loves salmon. And if you start talking about salmon, you can get everyone on the same page pretty quickly. It's a group that looks at the dynamics of a, a geographic area that is all one drainage and works to protect the resources that keep the water in, in a pristine quality. And, and to keep the water in a pristine quality, you have to protect some of the landscape in various ways. And so when the Watershed Project started, I was keen to you know, join in because it, it's the ideal way for man to live on the landscape is to keep in mind that all the people that live here are in a common resource zone and the water is what connects us all and the fish that swim in the water connects us all the way to the coast. And so the Watershed Project from the start, you know, they reached out to engage people upriver, you know, their headquarters in Cordova. Um, but they reached out early on and, and, you know, I joined in because I find it a valuable way of uh, metering how I look at the world.
Well, one of the really basic tenets of the Copper River Watershed Project that it was founded on is that it's, it's a watershed-wide organization, that any conversation that we have, any decisions that we try to make, if we don't include and consider the entire watershed, we're kind of setting ourselves up for failure. So um, I think it's really, really important for the two ends of the watershed to talk to each other and to understand their differences and their commonalities. Um, and it's weird because as you know, like even though we're connected by the river, you know, it's like 90 miles by river to get to Cordova, but it's a long ways around on the ferry or the plane and the highway and you go, you make a big loop in the wrong direction. And so people forget that we're connected. You know, there's a lot of people here who've never been to Cordova and vice versa. And so the Watershed Project is really working hard to bring that holistic way of thinking. Instead of I'm from Kenny Lake to feel like I'm from the whole Copper River Watershed Project or Copper River Watershed. I know that it's good for this area, you know, it's, it's a bridge building organization for this area. It brings people together. It's, they are really, really good at bringing people who think that they're not on the same side around a table and making them realize that deep down that we all believe in the same things. The way that the Watershed Project will coordinate with multiple agencies and groups and try to work all those towards a common goal is amazing to me. Because you can have one person working on a piece of it and one person working on a piece of it, but until you get that cohesive action, um, that's where you see the big, you know, the big things happen. And I think they do an excellent job of making that happen. It's a huge watershed. I mean, we're talking, you know, 67,000 square kilometers. Um, so there's a lot to do, and it's way more than any one single organization can handle. It's something that um, you need partnerships with people like the Copper River Watershed Project, the Native Village of EAC, National Park Service, you know, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, um, ATRAC. You know, you have to have these partnerships between the different organizations in the watershed um, to maximize the potential for the work that you can get done. So the Watershed Project, um, over our history, has worked building partnerships across the landscape. So there's not any one land manager that's responsible for managing all of the land. We're here on national forest land. Up in the interior, there's a um, large chunk of land that's National Park Service. There's BLM lands. There's uh, private lands, native corporation lands, state lands. Um, and so each entity might have roads on their lands that they're responsible for. They might have management practices that they're doing on their particular land. And we've been working to connect with these landowners and land managers and identify common issues that we can work together to address. The cool thing about the watershed project is they take that science and then they actually apply it to the projects that are going on. Um, so they learn about what's, from the, from the scientists, they're learning about what affects salmon and then they create projects to go do it. So the culvert project is a direct example of understanding the science and then going out and doing something about it. It was probably upwards of 12, 13 years ago now, there were some meetings up in the Copper Basin um, that identified that culverts were a big issue. So in our watershed, there are a few hundred culverts, even though we don't have that many people or that many miles of road compared to other parts of the country. Um, but we, uh, the state had done a, a study of the culverts and, and come to the conclusion that 64% were inadequate for fish passage, 32% needed more information, and about 6% were, I'm sorry, 4% were actually good for passing fish. Um, but what that didn't tell us was which ones were associated with the best fish habitats. I think one of the most like right now applicable important things the watershed does is their culvert restoration. Like I think that's huge and um, honestly it's something that I, I wasn't even aware we did until I got on the board and I was like, wow, people need to know this because that's super important. 
So we're here at 25 Mile in the Cop River Delta. It gets its name because we're 25 miles outside of downtown Cordova. Um, we've crossed the Cop River Delta to get here and along the way have um, crossed over many culverts. This is what I'm sitting on is one a newly installed fish friendly culvert. It's called a stream simulation design. Um, and the reason that we work to install these is because we want fish that are moving through our watershed to not realize when they're crossing under a roadway. Um, culverts that have been installed in the past um, have tend to be smaller um, and they're less costly when they're smaller and so there's an advantage to baking them uh, of the smaller size but the smaller pipes can constrict the stream they can increase the velocity of the water it can cause up and downstream scouring and changes the morphology of our streams um, so by installing these much larger culverts we can simulate what the stream is doing outside the influence of the road um, underneath the road through the, the larger culverts. The work the Watershed Project has done in, in identifying where salmon spawn, where rearing habitat is, and what it takes to protect that lowest thing on the totem pole, because most of us all the time don't think about what's happening with the little baby salmon. But if you build a road with a creek going under it and you put a culvert in that fish can't get through, then all of a sudden you've cut off everything upstream as fish habitat. And, and that was one of the things that the Watershed Project focused on early on. And even though uh, they don't have the resources to attack it all, they started one project at a time. And they've slowly worked towards eradicating all the hung culverts in the Copper Basin and expanded the, the ability for salmon to uh, go into all their uh, uh, natal habitat to, to raise, you know, to keep the salmon going. When I started with the organization is when we were just picking up, um, putting together a protocol for scoring these crossings. And so we would take measurements of the stream and measurements of the existing culvert and then develop a score for its ability to pass fish, as well as the quality of the habitat associated with the crossing. And then from there, we were able to come up with a rough ranking of which were the highest priority crossings on the uh, highest priority streams for restoration. Because um, restoration can be a little bit costly. This culvert was um, uh, over $100,000 just this one and there were two more that we installed as part of this project. So we needed to know where was the best place to, uh, to direct our restoration dollars. Um, so these crossings that we're uh, visiting today in particular were a result of um, this region-wide partnership that we had that had developed a, a score for culverts and had identified on the Copper River Highway of uh, the culverts that were the highest priority replacing, for replacing. And then we convened with partners including the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, NOAA, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, um, the U.S. Forest Service, and then Department of Transportation um, to s select a subset of culverts on the highway, um, looking at the highest scoring ones that were a priority for us. So we submitted funding, a funding request to the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council, and uh, we're very pleased to receive uh, just over $8 million to be replacing a total of 11 culverts on the Delta and removing two more that will just be they, there's no need to keep an open road over top of them. One of them happens to be in the woods and the other is a, a side road that will just be a low water ford. Um, so it, it's, we're very excited about it because it's actually restoration at the scale of a watershed within the watershed. So um, the, the culvert that I'm sitting on as well as uh, there's one to my left and one to my right um, that were all part of the same restoration effort and are all part of the 25 mile system. And so instead of just having to pick the one on the 25 mile system that could use the most work, we were able to replace all three of them this summer. Um, same thing next summer, we're working at 18 mile system, which is another big uh, coho, as well as a cutthroat trout uh, system here on the Delta. And we'll be replacing three culverts within that system. So again, not having to pick our favorite within 18 mile, but getting to to do all three of them is true watershed restoration um, at its best. <laughs> and so um, this culvert, the way that they're designed is, I meant, um, they're, the goal is to try to make it wide to simulate the stream going through it. Um, and what's hard to imagine is that this culvert is 20 plus feet wide, um, but it's also almost 17 feet deep. 
And so uh, it allows our, the contractor to actually use equipment to be able to move the stream material into the pipe and make the bottom look like the stream bottom before and after the road crossing. And so it requires quite a large um, pipe to be able to build that kind of substrate and stream bottom inside it and then for the the system out here based on the reference reaches of the stream we were using to design it this was the width that um, our engineers were determining would be the best because we also we not, not only want to accommodate fish but um, in increasing the size of your culvert can help protect your road infrastructure and so as we are seeing increases in an already rainy climate um, and seeing increases in precipitation um, and potential peak flow from glacial melt, we're gonna, uh, we want to make sure that we're designing these for a, a hundred year event and those hundred year events are changing in their, their size and so um, being large enough to handle that flow of water is definitely part of the, the long term plan for the design as well. People should support the watershed simply because it is, it's, a, it's a vital food source for the entire country, actually. I mean, uh, Copper River salmon are valued all around the world. I mean, everybody knows about Copper Valley salmon. They're, they're just amazingly good. And I don't know, it's something about the oils in them or something that make them a little bit better, I guess you'd say or valued than a lot of the other sources of salmon. And so it's just, it's vitally important to keep this watershed clean and pure so that we can continue to have that. People come here and they are just blown away by the openness, the size, the grandeur, but also the, uh, um, I don't think people even think or believe that there's places like this anymore. You see it on TV, but you figure, you know, TV's not really real, you documented it somehow or something like that and they see it firsthand and they grasp the scope of how big it is and how impressive it is. You're not going to get that in too many other places, I mean, other outside of Alaska. And uh, I think that's what makes me stick here. That's one of the things that uh, makes me want to be a part of this because it is the uh, not to quote a license plate, but the last frontier. And it's through that preservation of the, some place like this that uh, people will have this opportunity. So in order to make these projects happen and get to the place where we can be requesting funding like the scale that we received from the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council for this particular project, uh, there's a lot of time spent building relationships, building trust, um, getting on the ground data to be able to develop, uh, have the data we need to do the design, whether it's collecting hydrology data or uh, assessing fish populations. Um, and all of that is made possible because as a nonprofit, we have a, a broad membership support and individual contributors um, might not feel like they're giving a lot with their individual donation, but those all add up and support the time that we need to be able to build those relationship and make those connections um, and get to the point where we are today with being able to have a solid proposal to take to funders that is fundable and that they're excited to invest in making a reality. So um, definitely couldn't do it with, were it not for our membership support. One of the first things I did as a board member was um, writing little notes on thank you letters to some of our um, contributing members who've gone above and beyond. And I noticed that one of the members um, that I was helping write to was from Ohio. And that's where I grew up. They live about 45 minutes away from where I grew up in Ohio. And I kind of scratched my head thinking, why would somebody from Ohio be so interested in what's going on all the way up here? And I think that shows how important this place is to people who maybe even just visit. Um, that it really, that there are a lot of people that the watershed 
um, in our region of Alaska, it really speaks to them, whether they're here for tourism reasons, visiting family, um, or you know, as scientists. So I think for somebody who uh, might not live here or might not um, benefit from getting to recreate and enjoy this amazing Copper River Delta, uh, I think that there's a, still a, sig a significant value to helping to invest in keeping a watershed like the Copper River region intact. Um, for one, if anyone likes to enjoy Copper River salmon, it takes this intact, healthy watershed to produce the salmon, to keep salmon going to market, um, to be able to be enjoyed around the world. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier how the, there's not many river systems that are this intact and undisturbed. Uh, and so to be able to have a, a region, especially in the Pacific rim of rivers around the Pacific Ocean, to have a, a watershed like the Copper River continue to produce salmon, um, it can serve as a example or a, a reference for restoration in other parts of more disturbed areas. Um, and also can help produce fish that have a natural, tend a natural tendency to migrate and might, some of them might find new places to live and so in some of these more damaged areas having healthy salmon in nearby river systems could be an advantage um, to helping you know, keep salmon, Pacific salmon alive and well in other watersheds as well. It's not like you know, they're gonna, the whole population is going to look to recolonize but there's a natural straying that happens within salmon anyway and so being able to um, keep this watershed healthy is only going to benefit neighboring watersheds as well. I'm Ken Hodges and I'm a longtime supporter of the Copper River Watershed Project. Uh, I'd like to think that we could help uh, maintain this uh, ecosystem as it is now. Uh, by maintaining the habitats, we can keep uh, the commercial fisheries going as well as the sport and subsistence fisheries. Um, I've been out hunting today and uh, there's certainly all these wetlands support a number of uh, waterfowl, ducks, geese and other things that uh, are good for subsistence lifestyles.